Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Grant Cameron, and this is a presentation that I put together as a little bit of an update presentation called Alien Spirits and Information from the Field. I've written about this uh, in the past. I wrote a book called Inspired, the Paranormal World of Creativity. And in that book, I look at all sorts of different contact modalities where uh, people are able to get inventions, dreams, songs, poems, books, and they get it not through rational analytical thought. They will clearly tell you that they got it from some other source that it just came to them. And in the last little while, I've been doing some more research and I've seen some more examples of this kind of material. So what I'm going to present tonight is a little bit outside of what was in the book. And I find this very interesting that it does appear that either through us finding a way to get into the field through different contact modalities like um, ayahuasca, head injury, um, meditation, these sort of things, or channeling, mediumship, trauma, that we were able to get in the field to get this, that um, there's an awful lot of this material going on and a lot of material that is being given to us. The way I look at the whole um, field and how this works is that there is only consciousness. That's all there is. We start as consciousness. Uh, we go into this field of separation where we um, create dualities, good, bad, positive, this sort of thing. But in the end, there are no levels. There are no nouns. The universe is a verb. There are no nouns. There's no levels. There's no colors. There's just consciousness. And the analogy I always use is this one of the ocean, that we are at the bottom of the ocean, we are in the dark, and we believe that um, we're stuck here and that all we have is our brain to get us through. And from time to time, through some of these modalities that I've described before, trauma, head injury, uh, psychedelics, meditation, um, these sort of things, uh, daydreaming, that uh, people are able to float higher up into the into the water so it's not that they have anything uh, different they just get higher up in the water and the, the higher you get into the water the more light there is and the more you can see so some people it's almost like the analogy of um, piano players or hockey players there are people who can play hockey people who can play piano and then there are musicians and hockey players that some people are better at it than others, and some are able to get higher up into the water, move higher up into consciousness, and it's all the same consciousness, but the higher you get up into the consciousness, away from this uh, very dense physical reality where we, uh, or physical um, consciousness reality, where we think that's all there is, the higher we get up, the more we realize there's more to it. And so um, what happens is when you get higher up in the water, that's when these, um, inspirations, noetic experiences, and download situations take place where you're able to reduce these, the, the noise, which is the darkness, and you are able to pick up the signal, which is in the light, you're able to see more. Um, most people think, and I, I go through this in inspirations, that the vast majority of things that we've invented are rational, analytical, left brain things. And when you actually start to look at the actual data, you start to discover that a lot of it was noetic. Um, Eilert Einstein is the prime example, Nobel Prize winner, uh, came up with the theory of relativity, and he talks about the fact that this came from a dream. He had the dream of the toboggan going down the hill, moving at the speed of light, and he stated, I knew I had to understand that dream. In fact, you could say, and I would say, that my entire career was based upon a meditation on that dream. So whereas people think it's rational analytical, they figured it out, they're just very smart. Uh, at times they get help from the field. Einstein got in the field uh, and this comes with absolute certainty, which is uh, basically why I got into this field is I realized from my own experience in February 26th, 2012, that these type of things do happen where you get ideas that come into your head that come with absolute certainty and turn out to be the real um, sort of reality as to how things work. It just sort of pops in your head, comes with absolute certainty. 
Uh, the other one was uh, Bohr, Niels Bohr, uh, with Einstein. Uh, Niels Bohr also had, um, and this story is not 100% confirmed, but he got the idea of the quantum atom in a dream where he was at a horse track uh, where there was a voice that was telling him about how atoms move from shell to shell and that it's like a horse that can't step on the line. It has to move, be in one lane or the other and that you can't have two horses beside each other. One has to move back or forth for the other one to work. And this supposedly was where he got the idea of the quantum atom and he won the Nobel Prize for that as well which indicates that may not have been rational analytical. It may have also been a, a sort of a, a download or a noetic experience a moving higher into the water. Uh, the other one was the Heisenberg uh, principle, or the, um, the uncertainty principle was Heisenberg. Uh, this was 1925 um, and uh, Heisenberg got it. Um, he was with Bohr, um, Bohr went skiing, Heisenberg was walking behind the, Heisen the, the Bohr Institute in Copenhagen and saw this guy moving uh, along the path, going from the darkness to the light. And that's when he got this um, inspiration this, uh, for uh, what became known as the uncertainty principle. That did not become rational and analytical, it just popped into his head. Here's another one, Charles Towns, the inventor of the, the laser. Uh, he was sitting on a park bench when the idea popped into his head. Now he'd gone through all the work. He had worked through all the sort of the principles, but he couldn't figure it out. And then he went into what we call the daydreams uh, uh, situation where you uh, shut down the, the rational analytical left brain, you quiet the noise and the right brain picks up the signal and puts it all together for you and pops it into your head. So this one again, Nobel Prize winner, and that came noetically. Uh, here's Dennis Gabor, who came up with the hologram. Same thing, he was uh, working on the, on the principle, and then went and was sitting and was watching a tennis game. And while he was watching the tennis game, his, he, his left brain uh, quietened down, this, the uh, signal was picked up, and he suddenly understood how it all worked and raced to uh, write it all down. Uh, here's the one of the two invent, inventors of uh, Google. Uh, most people don't realize, uh, he says quite clearly uh, that the idea for Google, uh, this is uh, Page, came in the middle of the night. It came to him and he instantly knew how it was, would work. And he went to his um, instructor and told him that um, I've got this idea and I think I can do this in a couple of days. It took an awful long time, but the idea came for Google, came in a dream. Um, this is a um, model that's used by Ray Hernandez, who's the sort of the director now of the um, Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into ex um, Encounters with um, ET, non-human intelligence. And uh, this is a, um, a, a model that he got. Uh, I, I was meeting with him a couple of days before he got this model. Um, giving a consciousness lecture, we had a discussion. He had um, had an encounter where he was able to um, uh, bring in a UFO. He didn't think he could do it, and suddenly this thing appears, and he realized there was a consciousness connection. Talked to me. Um, I gave a lecture on consciousness a couple of days later. He's in a uh, traffic jam in Miami, Florida, and he is suddenly out of his body, and um, he has this noetic experience where he's being shown a wheel, and the wheel is moving around and um, he's been shown the contact, uh, UFO contact, shamanic journeys, uh, out-of-body experience, mystical meditation, channeling, remote viewing, near-death experiences, ghosts and spirits, that it's all the same thing and that we're parsing all this material. It's basically all the same thing and that the, it's all linked together by consciousness. And so he got this vision and started the um, Edgar Mitchell, with Edgar Mitchell, the foundation, to look at experiencers. And um, the important thing about experiencers, uh, UFO experiencers, is that these people are interacting with whatever uh, the intelligence is behind the UFO phenomena. And that intelligence is higher up in the water. And so um, for whatever reason, uh, experiencers are able to move out of the darkness, move up into the light, and they are given a bunch of material and they have some very revealing things that are shown and that comes from actually talking to 3,200 experiencers rather than just sort of trying to guess as to what you think is going on. When you talk to 3,200 experiencers, you realize there are very definite, distinct patterns as to what everybody's reporting. This is one of the key ones. This basically 
uh, states, do you believe that you possess information about advanced technology, advanced physics, or other scientific information that you've never read or learned in your normal environment? Now, this is a question that was asked to the 3,200 experiencers, and of the people who answered the question, 41.73%, basically 42% of them said, yeah, I've got uh, advanced technical, scientific, or physics information in my head that I didn't learn in school. This is basically download. This is coming to them. They are somehow got into the field up higher into the water, into the closer to the light, and this material came in their head. And I've had people show me this. I've had one woman particularly showed me a 25 page paper, uh, had all sorts of formulas and stuff like that in it. And uh, it was 25 pages long and it was on her cell phone. And I said, well, did you get this? In a download, she said, yeah. She said, and I'll let you know, I'm a secretary, I've never taken science. So you get this kind of stuff and you find this repeatedly with experiencers that people are talking about the fact that they were given material and information that they did not learn in school. An even more dramatic statistic that comes when you interview 3,200 experiencers who have interacted with the intelligence behind the UFO phenomena is that when you ask them, they will tell you when they're in this matrix type reality, they, they find themselves in this reality that they describe as a matrix. Did you, did you suddenly seem to understand everything? 40% of all experiencers say at one point during their experience, they knew the answer to everything in the universe, which would indicate if that's true, and this is a very high statistic for 3,200 people to be answering a question, to indicate that all the information may be in the field, all the answers are in the field, and it's a matter of access. It's a matter not so much of uh, can you figure this thing out, but can you shut down the noise in order to pick up the signal? And if you can pick up the signal, basically you have access to everything. The fact that, that this is being shown to them by non-human intelligence and they're allowed into this field would indicate the non-human intelligence has access to all this information in the field. So they're helping these people get it. And I've talked to a number of these people and I've questioned them and I've, of course, said to them, how do you know it was everything that, that they had the answer to everything? How do you know there wasn't something like number 789 on the far side of the universe that they forgot to tell you about? And they will say exactly what I said when I had my noetic experience in 2012, I'm not sure, I just know. I know that I knew everything. That's what they'll tell you. And they don't know why, how they know it, they just know. And I asked a number of them, I said, how long did you know this? And they said, I knew it when the experience ended and it started to fade like a dream. And by the end of the first day, it was all gone, except for the fact that they remembered at one point they knew the answer to everything in the universe. And this is very important to uh, anybody who wants to figure out what's going on, is that if you want to figure out what's going on, you've got to talk to these people because it's totally stupid to ignore these people because if they are telling the truth, if they have had access to this material, it would be totally stupid and ignorant not to at least talk to them and find out if you can help and get, let them get you into the field to get this material. Uh, Susie Hansen is a uh, um, long-time experiencer, has written two very good books on, has had extreme amounts of material that, that she recalled. Uh, she talks about being given all sorts of material about how the universe works, how um, the spiritual world works, how the connection between the spiritual and the physical world. And she's also been given technology. She talked about one particular uh, piece of equipment uh, that she saw that was also seen by this guy in the back when the blue there, that's Steve Boucher. Now, Steve Boucher told me the story. I knew that he had it. And what he was shown was a, an instrument that um, the beings used on his arm and they could show his arm and you could see the veins in his arm with this uh, instrument that, that cast this green sort of uh, light onto his arm. And then they could alter it and they could show his bones and they could show his muscles and they were using this instrument on his stomach. Now, both um, Steve Boucher and Susie Hansen saw this piece of equipment. Steve saw it in about 1972. Susie Hansen saw it in the 1980s, and it has now been uh, discovered. It is now technology that is available. They can't do the, the bones and the, the muscle, but they, this instrument does exist that can cast this green light on uh, an arm, and you can see 
the vein. So these people saw this technology long before it was made public. Uh, here's uh, Jacques Arfati, who tells a story about 1952, and this is before anybody actually had an encounter uh, with an alien. Uh, Jacques Arfati is a physicist in California, uh, has been involved in the UFO phenomena, and was involved in the remote viewing program in the 1970s. And he talks about an experience that he had as a, uh, a kid about 13 years old, uh, where he gets a phone call on uh, the phone, and uh, the, the, the voice claims that it's a, a computer on board a flying saucer, and that they have identified uh, 400 of the top bright minds in uh, the world, and they want to download their information and said to him, you have to agree to do this. And he said the minute he agreed to do this, just as a joke, he felt this kundalini energy go up the back of his uh, spine. And he still maintains today that the material that he's producing in terms of zero point energy and um, how the Tic Tac, the uh, Nimitz Tic Tac flies, he is claiming that that material has been given to him, that he has been, he's getting this material from a noetic source outside of his brain. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, a photograph that, that we've never shown before. Uh, this has to do with um, experiences that uh, have been reported by uh, the Mission Rama people. Um, there's been a lot of um, um, experiences where it's like a CE5. It, this was started in Peru by Sixto and Charles uh, Paz. And uh, they have had a lot of interactions with beings that have uh, put a, across a lot of material on um, spiritual aspects about how the world works. And uh, the Rama people are uh, often able to determine exactly when the craft will come by and exactly uh, where it is and what time, almost to the minute. Uh, this is a, um, a photograph that was taken in one of the circles uh, a number of years ago. Uh, at Mount Shasta and the woman was in the the circle where they're trying to raise the meditation just before the CE5 encounter takes place and she's just photographing randomly and photographs uh, she's at sitting so this is at eye level um, and what you see is it appears to be like a being with a belt and you can see the hand there standing right beside her in the circle. Uh, this is a book called American Cosmic, written by Diane Posolka. Um, this is, um, she's religion, head of religion and philosophy at the uh, University of North Carolina. And um, she's written a book, and in this book, there is some description again about material, material that is being given to people through this noetic uh, process, rather than rational analytical, uh, they're getting it from other uh, processes. This is a guy who's identified in her book as Tyler D. Um, Tyler D, I've had converse, uh, two conversations with him, and he told me uh, he's a, from NASA, and he told me about his initial experience, which is talked about in Diane Pasolka's book. And um, in that experience, he told me um, the morning he got the invention idea in his head, that eventually went on to the space shuttle to be tested and they wouldn't put it on the space shuttle. They had to fight to get somebody to sign off and get this thing on the space shuttle because everybody said it was crazy, it would never work. Uh, it did work, but he said the last thing here, he said the last thing I remember the, the a night before that um, ex idea came in my head in the morning was a hooded figure standing at the end of the bed. And I said to him, I said, well, could you see its face? He said, no, I couldn't see its face. So he linked it immediately to uh, some sort of outside um, source that was helping him, giving him this material. And he describes a contact modality quite clearly, uh, according to Diane Pasolka's description of the book, that um, he sleeps for eight hours at night. Uh, he then gets up, then he goes back to bed for another hour, then he gets up, then he drinks a big glass of water sitting in the sun. And at that point, he is able to interact with these intelligences that uh, I guess originally gave him this first idea and he's got 40 patents and a lot of this stuff is medical stuff. So you see um, a guy in uh, the, the aerospace industry who is actually using this process of moving up into the water, higher up into the light and picking up material and bringing it back down into our physical dark universe. Here's Gary Nolan, who's another one that's described uh, in the book, um, Gary Nolan is a um, professor at um, 
Stanford University. He's uh, noted for doing the DNA experiment with uh, experiencers, where they're looking at the DNA uh, of experiencers, people who claim to have um, non-human intelligence contact. And uh, they're also looking at the brain pattern of experiencers to see uh, why are these people able to bring in the phenomena? Why are they able to uh, make contact? And they're looking at these two aspects. Uh, he's been experiencer his entire life. And when it comes to this noetic experience material, he says, I don't know how it works. I don't know if there's little elves in your head, but I know how to make it work. And this is the same sort of process that a lot of scientists have used. You go through the whole process, you run through all the questions, uh, you analyze everything. And then he said, you put the question beside the bed at night, you wake up in the morning, and he said, the idea is in my head. And he said, I don't know how it works, but I know how to make it work. So you see this process that um, people are able to tap into this field and bring in material that is not uh, created by a very smart, rational, analytical left brain. It's created uh, by shutting down the left brain and having the right brain go into the field and pick up the material and bring it back. Uh, this uh, experiences goes uh, also not just to UFO experiences, it also goes to near-death experience uh, people. Uh, this is Karen Hanning, uh, who had a near-death experience in 1951. She describes quite clearly in 1951 being shown technology that exists today. Here's what she says, you know, uh, there were like these typewriters, of course, uh, but these were not keyboards like that. They had these little squares and they also lit up. I could see the light underneath them, like like the summer. They were blue and some were red and, and somewhat green. And I remember that the man told me, he said, you will see these later in your life. And she's basically in 1951 describing a computer keyboard. And she said that she saw this 1951. Uh, here's another one, uh, Sherry Wild. Uh, talks about um, material that she was given, this entire book uh, she stated was um, downloaded to her. She basically uh, was sitting at a typewriter one day and found herself on page three and a half that this had all been written. She didn't even remember writing it. And uh, so the book came to her. She also talks about an interesting phenomenon that I'm looking at now is the fact that there may be um, scientists um, on the other side, scientists who have died, who have now come back to help um, enlighten the world, to get material into the world. Uh, Sherry Wild states that when she was 15 years old, uh, she met a number of uh, people on board a flying saucer. One was Albert Einstein, one was Albert Schweitzer, and one was Nikola Tesla. Now, Nikola Tesla pops up all the time. I asked her immediately, I said, okay, you saw these people on board the ship, and she talked to a number of, uh, she was introduced to a number of very famous people on board the ship. And I said, of course, I said, well, was, were these people physical? And she said, I know where you're going with this. She said, it may have been a hologram, but it was very, very real. And so the question is, is it possible that these uh, um, um, people are coming back? Because if they're dead, how do you recreate these people? How do you have these people come back into the physical uh, environment? if they're already dead and there are supposedly a, a spirit body. Uh, this happens all the time in, in UFO encounters on board ships, and it indicates that the alien intelligence or whatever this is, has control over the uh, spirit world as well. And what you see is you see uh, people describing, uh, there was one woman I was on a, a show with her, who talked about the fact that her dead husband was on board the ship and she was really angry. My husband is dead, why are you doing this to me? And she said he was as real as could be and she defied it. She said, I do not believe this. He had a birthmark on his back, lift his shirt. And they turned the guy around and he had the birthmark on his back and she said it was as real as real could be. Uh, there are people who have been shown uh, dogs uh, on board the ship and you see this uh, idea that Whatever um, this is, the aliens seem to be able to bring back dead people and make them look as real as, as can be, that they seem to have some control over this. And secondly, the idea that these scientists may be coming back and actually may be working with the intelligence behind the phenomena and with um, physical mediums, which I'll get into in a minute, 
and that they are helping us uh, increase our technology and helping bring this material uh, back, that they are higher up in the water in the field and that people get up there and they're actually able to interact with former top scientists who are trying to help. Uh, here's a, one of the, the biggest one. This is the Soul Phone, which is um, uh, at the point of being developed. They have the first stage of the Soul Phone, and this is a phone that uh, Gary Schwartz has developed and a, and a team of his people. And um, this is a, where they're able to actually use technology uh, now at very elementary levels to actually interact with people in the spirit world. What is surprising about what he's done, and he's worked a lot with mediums um, in California and uh, worked on the cell phone. And this is, uh, according to his wife, this is uh, what they describe. Gary Schwartz, who is working on the cell phone, states there are 30 key people on the other side helping with the work. Members include Albert Einstein, David Bohm, inventors Thomas Edison, and Nikola Tesla. Harry Houdini and Michael Jackson are serving as technical co collaborators. And Marcia Eklund, uh, Susie, uh, Susie Smith, Carl Sagan, Edgar Mitchell, and others inspire us in so many ways, keeping us convinced of their continued interest and dedication by showering us with seemingly endless array of evidential signs and synchronicities. So again, you have a second one, you have uh, first, uh, uh, um, Susie, uh, Sherry Wilde talking about interacting with these um, scientists and then you get Gary Schwartz talking about these scientists are interacting and if we go on we get uh, Sonia Rinaldi who is doing absolutely spectacular work in terms of EVPs. We used to use EVPs and they were very sort of uh, hard to determine. You had A level, B level and C level um, EVPs where people would use um, uh, um, white noise uh, and a technical or electronic equipment to pick up um, voices from uh, spirits. It was very, very uh, elementary. And uh, what Sonia has done is she has used a different technique. Instead of using white noise, she has actually um, used uh, people's voices. So if she has the dead person's voice, what she does, is she breaks it down into um, uh, just little pieces of words and she mixes it all together and she uses that instead of white noise and she claims uh, and you've, you there's a lot of tapes out there where um, the person is able to communicate uh, very clearly and not just one or two sentences but is able to answer 30 or 40 questions she's also developed this um, this uh, equipment here where she uses this uh, sort of like a plastic egg where they uh, will put white noise from four different projectors into this white egg and stand it up. And they are able to create um, spirit pictures um, in this, um, this environment. So she's sort of at the leading edge of this EVP technology. She's been working on it for 30 years. And if you take a look at some of her material, it's absolutely dramatic. The results that she's getting using this sort of high end, all A-level um, EVPs, and extremely uh, promising material that she's able to reproduce um, at will and um, produce some very good material. What she says is that uh, Tesla is helping her, that Tesla is part of this and that there's contact with Tesla, that he's helping them develop this technology, almost like Gary Schwartz, they're getting help from the other side. And the other one that she claims is, um, is Konstantin uh, Radov, who uh, was working on EVPs himself. He wrote a book called Breakthrough in 1971. And you can see him here, you can see uh, his photo uh, in this egg where they produce, he appears in this um, plastic egg where it's reproduced and um, they've got a lot of communication with him. And he is helping this technology from the other side, trying to develop this technology. So what you have is a situation where on our side, we're trying to work on this, and the other side is actually working in cooperation to help us develop this technology to uh, interact with the, um, the spirit world or the non-local non world higher up in the uh, water where there's more light. Uh, this is Kai Muga, um, and here's a, on a port. He's famous for producing a ports here. And I'll describe who's a port this is in a minute, but Kai Muga is a physical medium 
I've spent a lot of time with physical medium studying them now. And uh, Kai Muga is also um, um, part, part of his story is that he's getting help from uh, Hans Bender, who was a parapsychologist, a German parapsychologist who died in 1991. And um, he's the control on the other side. So Kai Muga uh, gets these apports. They appear out of his eyes, out of his nose, out of his ears. Uh, he has full physical manifestations appear. Uh, very, very dramatic uh, material uh, under as tight controlled conditions as they can put it on him. And the, the claim is that um, Hans Bender is on the other side and, ha and Kai Muga is actually part of a DNA test that we are going to do uh, to see if um, under trans condition his DNA appears the same. We're going to predict that his DNA will change to Hans Bender's DNA when he is in a full trance mode. So that's basically what I wanted to uh, go through on this presentation, just to show you that there's a lot of material, there's a lot of indication that um, uh, people are being helped in various fields from some other source, from uh, a source that's outside the physical world, and we're being helped to develop new technology and new understandings about how the universe works. Uh, this is sort of my final one. This is um, uh, Sa Sandy uh, Ingham, who is a, um, a psychic uh, painter. These are fascinating people if you've ever seen them paint. Um, she uh, paints through Leonardo da Vinci, paints through her. This started 10 years ago. She's been a medium her whole life. And suddenly this painting started and um, she is able to paint um, um, dead people. Um, she All she needs is a sample of your handwriting and she will produce um, uh, one of your dead relatives and she paints. She's never painted in her life till 10 years ago or drawn and um, the, the, the story is that Leonardo da Vinci is coming through her and as with other spirit painters she can do paint two paintings at the same time in full trance. Both hands are painting or drawing and she can draw two people at the same time and uh, these are some of the drawings that she's done and according to what she told me in the interview that I've just posted, uh, he's never wrong. He always gets them and people have been shocked. She's toured the world doing this uh, trans painting. And so again, you have Leonardo da Vinci coming across trying to prove that there is life on the other side and to prove that um, we are getting cooperation and help. So I wanna thank you for listening and we will update this presentation as more material comes in uh, very promising material, uh, a lot of, um, lot of evidence to indicate uh, we are not alone, we are getting help. So thanks for, your, thanks for listening.